thank you everyone for showing up. Uh, today we have Tim Hall, uh, who perhaps needs no introduction, but he'll be talking to us about wrestling with context. Uh, this is a first lecture of its kind that he's done, so I'm super excited to hear about this. Uh, take it away, Tim. Cool. Thank you, Charles. Um, all right. So uh, everyone can see the screen here, right? Wrestling with context, understanding wrestling in the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see it. Cool. Great. Um, so uh, a lot of things <laughs> went into um, encouraging me uh, or motivating me to actually do this lecture. Um, and uh, I think it's been a long time coming, um, particularly because there's a lot of misinformation regarding what wrestling may have been like in the Middle Ages versus what it is nowadays. Um, and uh, I was just hoping uh, that with this, that I can kind of eventually take it on the road. You guys are going to be my guinea pigs here today and um, spread some of uh, some correct information rather than misinformation. Um, <clears throat> so some of the things that, some of the questions that motivated me to um, start with this uh, are things like, what kind of rules did they use historically for competitions? Um, wondering what the wrestling background of a historical practitioner might have been. So we, we hear often enough in HEMA that, you know, wrestling is the foundation of the art and that everyone was a wrestler back then and they would have all been familiar with it. But, you know, to what extent were they familiar and, and uh, what did their wrestling look like compared to ours nowadays? Um, and uh, why did these masters speak so highly of wrestling? What was so great about it that it was the foundation of their art or, you know, the best way to, to get in shape or, or to learn to fight? Um, and uh, I also wanted to be able to answer um, when people ask, okay, well, so you do this thing ring and what does it look like? Um, is it like judo or wrestling? Um, and well, the answer to that question is neither really, um, but somewhere in the middle. Uh, which is not a totally um, great descriptive answer to give, uh, even if it's accurate. Um, so those sorts of questions were, were kind of what led me to, to do this. And ultimately, I guess what this lecture will be is sort of a summary of uh, the information that I found regarding those sorts of things and some other stuff, um, as we'll see uh, as we go through this. Um, so moving on. Um, <clears throat> some introductory notes to you real quick. So this lecture is focused on building an understanding of medieval wrestling for HEMA. Um, and because of that, it covers a pretty wide time frame, um, probably wider than uh, you would want to use if you were going to research specifically, um, you know, wrestling in a, in a particular culture or time period, because, you know, three not 300, 200 years is, is a pretty wide span of time. Um, and so things naturally changed a lot over that time, but um, that's HEMA. That's what I was working with. And, and really, it's, this is not an academic study. This is more just trying to inform our, our practice here. Um, <clears throat> that being said, uh, everything that I present, I, I try to make sure it's defensible through primary sources. Um, I'm not just making things up or guessing um, and, and if there's something that is just conjecture or, or you know, my best assumption, I'll definitely point it out. Um, I try to be transparent with all of that kind of stuff. Um, uh, let's see. Um, there, <laughs> there will be very few absolute and definitive statements, uh, as you'll see, which is also true. Those of you who have taken classes and stuff with me before, you know that very rarely do I say this is always the way it is um, because there are so many variations in things. Um, so I guess I, I'm not really presenting an argument um, for anything in particular here. It, we're just kind of gonna be exploring some ideas. Um, there's also no living traditions that claim lineage from the Fekbusher, and I know I'm missing an umlaut over the U, I think. I just noticed that. Um, <clears throat> that's besides the point. Uh, they, there are living traditions in Europe, um, 
of like traditional wrestling styles, uh, but none of them claim any sort of lineage or, or connection to uh, the stuff we study in HEMA. Um, and then the last thing not really listed on the bullet points there is, um, this is just not a pet peeve, just something I like to specify, uh, especially if we start coming in contact with German speaking practitioners that ringen is the modern word uh, the modern German word for wrestling, um, as well as the historical term they used. Um, so if, if you say ringen to someone in Germany, they, they might understand it to be like freestyle or Greco-Roman wrestling. Um, so trying to create clear terminology is something else that I, I've been working on. And um, so I'll often say medieval wrestling, um, maybe sometimes historical ringen or medieval ringen. Um, just something to, to clarify uh, that it's not modern wrestling practiced in Germany. Um, so the topics that we'll, we'll go through are, um, one, wrestling in medieval culture. Two, um, I'll try to paint a picture of uh, a theoretical common medieval wrestler to parallel that idea of the, the common fencer that we talk about in, in Leech and Hour sources sometimes. Um, <clears throat> and then three, wrestling in HEMA. And we'll split that up into uh, HEMA as in the stuff in the past, as well as HEMA as in the stuff we do nowadays. All right, so wrestling in medieval culture. Uh, the first quote I have up there is from Jessica Finley's book, if you don't have it and you're interested in medieval wrestling, you should definitely get it. Um, but she says in it that one could draw an analogy between medieval wrestling and modern baseball in the United States during the 1950s. Uh, and there's a lot more to that. It's, it's a whole paragraph and I just took a chunk there um, just to kind of get us talking about that idea. Um, and I think uh, maybe a modern parallel could be football. Um, although I don't know that football has the same cultural significance that maybe baseball did in the 50s. Um, but uh, so this idea that everyone would have wrestled growing up, um, there may be professional wrestlers who still do it as adults. Um, adults like to watch wrestling uh, and they're familiar with the strategies and the techniques and, and the rules generally of how things should go. Um, so this society that is uh, aware and familiar with wrestling, um, very different from the society we have nowadays, which uh, unless you're engrossed in some of those um, circles, like BJJ is really common nowadays. Um, if you're not a part of those circles, then uh, you're not really deep in with, with wrestling. Um, although there's certainly exceptions, um, like if we talk about, uh, folk style wrestling in high school and college out in the Midwest or in the Northeast. Um, we kind of see that there. Um, th there's certainly big wrestling following in those areas. Um, so this idea that uh, everyone kind of knows a little bit about it, even if they don't do it anymore, they at least did it when they were a kid. Um, <clears throat> and uh, there are amateurs, I, I mentioned professionals, but there are also amateur tournaments and stuff too. Um, where they, people could win prizes and, and things. And we'll, we'll look into that a little bit later. Um, so it was very much a part of their culture. Um, and I added a quote down there by uh, Duarte, who, who has a treatise on horsemanship. Um, and uh, of all things in it, he talks about the importance of wrestling um, in, in some sections. And uh, he's got a whole bunch to say about it, but this is just a bit. Um, he says that the good physical arts that pertain to everybody according to their estate should never be neglected, uh, particularly riding and wrestling, which are the foundations from which one proceeds to the greatest honors. Um, and that's really similar to uh, an idea that we hear in um, 3227A, um, that Derbringer effect, uh, that I, there's not a great name for it. Everybody knows it by something different. Um, but I think you all know what I'm probably talking about there. The, the quote that, um, you know, like all uh, nobility comes from wrestling um, and all fighting comes from wrestling. We'll, we'll look at that one later too. Um, but th there's sort of that same idea echoed in that. Um, <clears throat> yeah. 
think that's what I was going to say about that. Um, so we've got here uh, just some images that I, I wanted to show you all um, to kind of drive home that idea that wrestling was part of their culture. And in, in the top left, you have um, two misery cords from churches. Uh, I believe they're, those are both in England. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, you know, they have these carvings of wrestling in, in funny places like that. Um, and, and a neat uh, idea that comes along with those, um, at least it occurred to me, whether it was the intention of the artist or not, um, is these uh, particular things that we see here are actually used to help support people um, who are standing in the choir. They can kind of lean up on it um, to rest their weight on it so they're not, you know, standing for extended periods of times, although it may still appear like they're kind of standing. Um, and we see underneath uh, these images of wrestlers leaning into each other, kind of supporting each other out. Um, uh, and, and this idea of balance that is, is big to wrestling and, and well, medieval wrestling in particular, they talk about balance and scales a lot. Um, but just this idea that the bench, the misery cord there is performing the same function as the wrestlers against each other underneath. Um, I thought that was neat. Um, down below we see um, like a sort of a field day, um, whether it's just symbolism or they actually had events like that, uh, we do see that wrestling is included in all those activities that we see. Um, and uh, Charles actually ran an event, the historical nightly physical training, I think is what he called yeah. it. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we did a lot of those things there um, and wrestling was part of it and it, it was cool. It, it fit in and um, it fits with this idea that uh, wrestling was part of uh, your physical training sort of regimen for staying fit or preparing for war or just something that people did for fun. Um, off to the right, uh, we see Fabian von Auerswald, who was uh, a famous wrestling master. Uh, a little bit later, 1539, is when he published his treatise, um, and he actually died shortly after that. Um, possibly before it was even printed. Um, I think he finished it and died before it was printed. Um, but his, his treatise was printed by the same, um, in the same uh, workshop as the Martin Luther Bible um, and had some pretty important patrons for his work. Uh, I don't remember exactly who it was, but he was uh, an elector of Saxony and became quite a big figure during the, um, the wars, during the Reformation and stuff there. Um, some other examples of, of where we hear about wrestling, um, from like literature in Chaucer, uh, they talk about the Miller who was a wrestler and he's, uh, winning a Ram, um, which is a, an idea that, uh, well, I mean, not even just an idea, they still do it nowadays in some areas. Um, Garen, which is one of the, uh, still traditional uh, wrestling arts that's practiced nowadays, you can win a sheep, um, in some competitions by winning. Uh, and we also see that in other parts of the world as well, winning livestock for winning wrestling competitions, which um, nowadays is kind of a novelty um, perhaps, but historically was a big deal. Um, these things were worth a lot of money. Um, kind of a funny example. Uh, so wrestling was something they did after uh, and during feasts and after celebrations and holy days and things like that. Um, in Jessica Finley's book, she mentions an example of um, them needing to ban wrestling matches after mass and after feasts because they would get so rowdy um, that they would like trash the fields outside of the church, uh, which I thought was pretty funny. It kind of reminds me a little bit of um, like the football hooligans in, um, in England and stuff. Just these fans getting wild and crazy and trashing things. Um, but yeah, it, it, it was very prevalent through all of their culture, their daily life. Um, the idea that I get is that they couldn't really go, you know, maybe a week without running into wrestling of some sort uh, in, in some way. Um, much different than we have nowadays. Um, so building on that a little bit, um, I wanted to give some examples, um, you know, as part of religions, uh, we see it in, in the religion and some legends and mythology. Um, 
and uh, the two I want to mention on this slide are, are the two on the bottom. We'll talk about the next three in the next slide. Um, they're kind of honorable mentions because uh, it gets a little bit farther north than, than really the area that I was interested in looking into. Um, but there are things that people are probably familiar with. So Beowulf and Grendel, I think everybody's probably familiar with Beowulf. Um, he defeats Grendel uh, by wrestling with him. Um, they like strip off their clothes. And he strips off his clothes and waits for him and um, surprises him and wrestles him and ultimately rips his arm off to defeat him and, and hangs it on the door. Uh, and kind of a neat idea, I think, is, um, well, <laughs> maybe neat. I don't know. I, I, I'm weird about this stuff. But um, we see in uh, particularly the dagger stuff a lot, um, although it is in, in ringing, um, just straight wrestling, um, like these arm breaks and shoulder dislocations and things like that, attacking the arms was a really uh, common tactic. Um, and I, I looked up because I was interested uh, what it takes to pull someone's arm off. Um, and, and the best I could find was that it takes 82 pounds of force to rip your arm out of the socket. Uh, and that was actually published um, in an article in the Journal of Arthroscopic and Related Surgery, Volumes 24, Issue 1 in 2008. Um, so that's the best answer I could find, 82 pounds of force to rip your arm out. Um, uh, the next one there is um, Thor versus Ellie. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how that's pronounced. Um, Ellie is what I'm going with. Uh, but Ellie was a, an old woman that Thor wrestled and, and ultimately couldn't beat. And in the end, he loses the wrestling match, um, and the way he lost was being driven down to one knee. Uh, and that's important um, here uh, because this idea of driving someone down to one knee uh, is not unique to that story and actually um, was pretty common throughout uh, medieval wrestling through the rest of Europe as well. Um, we have examples of rule sets where touching the ground with anything but your feet is a loss. Um, and we also have examples of rules from um, armed tournaments, uh, in, in armored even tournaments, where uh, driving someone down to their knee uh, showed that you've, you've defeated them. Um, so not just wrestling specific, but even in, you know, you know, two guys going at it with pole axes and full plate armored, they drive someone down to their knee and you've beaten them. Um, so that idea uh, was pretty common. Um, <clears throat> ultimately, Ellie ended up being the personification of old age. That's why she was able to defeat Thor. Um, but yeah, he just driving him down to a knee was what the winning condition was there. So uh, we've got two examples here. Um, let me go back. Can I go back? There we go. Um, the top two, Jacob and the Angel and Hercules. Hercules wrestling everyone um, because apparently <laughs> he wrestled everyone. Uh, but um, you can see that these were uh, known about uh, at the very least during the Middle Ages and early Renaissance um, by the dates there, 1528 and the, on the right side, 1372. Um, uh, but this idea of um, like classics would have been familiar uh, classic mythology might have been familiar to a medieval person. Um, certainly biblical um, iconography uh, would have been, and symbolism would have been common uh, for a medieval person to be aware of. Um, but we have uh, on the left side, Hercules wrestling Antaeus, I believe is how you pronounce it. Um, ultimately, he beat, it, he beat him by picking him up into the air, um, squeezing him and crushing him to death. Uh, and he was able... Uh, only able to win that way because um, Antaeus being, uh, I think I wrote it down here, um, the giant son of Poseidon and Gaia, uh, his source of power was from the earth. And as long as he was in contact with the earth, he couldn't be beaten. Um, so Hercules said, okay, I'll pick you up and crush you to death. And that's what happened. Um, on the right side, uh, Jacob uh, and the angel um, is the story from Genesis. Uh, where they wrestle on a riverbank. Um, and uh, that one's pretty common, commonly depicted in uh, like illuminated manuscripts and, and other biblical medieval art. Um, 
so this is a fun one. Uh, the Field of the Cloth of Gold was an event uh, that took place in June of 1520. Um, it was uh, like a summit to promote peace between France and England. Uh, they had all sorts of show and fanfare. Um, there's a tournament uh, and wrestling matches. Wikipedia tells me they had Cornish and Breton wrestlers, um, which are uh, styles of wrestling that persist to this day. Um, how accurate that is, I don't know. I didn't see any um, source cited there. Um, but the <laughs> but I, I, I did see that um, the King of France, Francis, brought wrestlers from Brittany um, as part of his troop of people that he brought along with him. So th there may be some truth to that. Um, but uh, really what I want to get into here is that uh, although they agreed not to face each other in the tournament, King Henry, Henry VIII, um, challenged Francis to a wrestling match, which he ultimately lost. Um, but uh, it's kind of this neat example of, you know, at the very lowest end of society, you know, there were wrestlers sort of in the mid range, there were professional wrestlers who would have wrestled at this, this large event. And then even at the very top, the Kings were wrestling each other, um, which is cool. Uh, and we see on the left is King Francis on the right, King Henry the eighth and uh, in the middle, that's not them wrestling. That's just two wrestlers from the event. Um, in the top right of that tapestry, which is cut off, is, is actually King Francis. Interesting that Obviously. they say it was a Breton style, and that's not a typical Breton grip that we're seeing in the middle, at least in modern modern Goran style. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, you're right. That we're not seeing a typical grip from that style. Um, and also something else neat to point out is they're wearing clothes and they're wearing kind of the normal clothes of the day, um, mm -hmm. which is something we see. Uh, we'll get into attire later, um, but just kind of keep that example in mind as we move through here. <clears throat> so sources, uh, we saw a little bit about, um, well, <laughs> getting ahead of myself. Uh, we're gonna look at a theoretical or potential common medieval wrestler. Um, like I said, to kind of, meet our wrestling example of like deletion hours, common fencer on um, this idea of uh, what the average person would have known about um, the style of fighting or wrestling uh, before receiving training um, in the sources that we look at that I looked at to build this, um, this idea uh, it was contemporary art a little bit. We saw um, in the previous slides there uh, some historical documents, which would have been um, commentary on wrestling, uh, like Duarte, which you saw in the first first couple of slides there. Uh, Monty is another, Pietro Monty is another big one. Um, he gives us really good in-depth and detailed descriptions of wrestling. Um, and uh, documented rules, which are, which are very scarce, Monty being um, one of the big ones. And then also a, um, from a little bit later, the 1600s uh, is a, um, I don't know if it was a manuscript or, or what kind of legal document or what, but it was something that Matt Gallus translated uh, that was a rule set and description of a wrestling style practiced in Rome and within 20 leagues around Rome in the parishes. Um, so that's a really cool one we looked at. Uh, and, and then also living traditions um, helped inform my perspective on this as well. Um, and I provide some examples down below. Um, you don't really need to know those names other than if you want to look into uh, what those styles might look like. And, and I've got um, later on examples we see down at the end um, over here, examples, uh, which is going to be a little video clips about some of the uh, traditional styles that are still practiced nowadays. Um, so here we've got a picture of um, Milo of Croton, Milo of Croton, who was um, a famously successful Greek wrestler from the mid to late 6th century BCE. Uh, and if you are into strength training at all, you might know him from this uh, anecdote of how he carried a bull every day up a hill. Um, and every day it got heavier and every day he got stronger because he continued to do it. And it's sort of an analogy for 
uh, like progressive overload and strength training that people talk about nowadays. Um, but it's just another part of his story. Um, he was also apparently famous for saving Pythagoras's life. Um, but that's just that guy over to the right side there. Um, you can see they're, they're wearing uh, not ancient Greek clothes, but uh, attire of medieval Europe. Um, and another example of people wrestling clothes there and, and what, what kind of attire they might have been wearing when they were wrestling, which is actually the next slide that we'll look at here. Um, so ultimately, uh, what we've got is um, if someone asks you a question, your answer can be yes. Did they wrestle clothed? Yes. Did they wrestle unclothed? Yes. Did they wrestle barefoot? Yes. Um, with shoes? Yes. So they wrestled any way that they could uh, if art uh, and other descriptions are anything to go by. Um, sometimes props were used as well. Uh, so we'll see in some later images I have uh, in the lecture, they, um, in England, they had a scarf that they would wrap around um, the neck or the shoulder and neck of, of an opponent that they would wrestle with. They might have a, like a special belt um, that we'll hear about a little bit later as well. Uh, and then living traditions, often have special clothing that they wear that um, appears to be inspired by historical outfits uh, and at the very least kind of creates some of the same function that we saw even if it doesn't look aesthetically exactly the same. Holds is a quick one here. Um, they use all sorts of holds uh, just like attire where they wore all sorts of things they used all sorts of sorts of holds as well. In the bottom right um, we see an image of uh, like a, a grip on the belt, uh, which was common. Um, on the left side, and actually the left and the top right, I, I lost my source. Um, so I, I, I'll have to put that in later. Um, but you see the scarf wrestling on the left side and in the top right, uh, they're doing back hold, which is where you've uh, locked your hands behind your opponent's back, one arm over one side of their one of their shoulders and one arm under the shoulder on the other mm -hmm. side, and you can't break that grip. You have to wrestle like that and stay close. Um, so they use all sorts of different holds, including no holds at all, where they would just engage sort of like um, this image here, right? They're closing in from out of range and trying to grab each other's hands to get good grips on each other. So rules. Rules is the big one here. Um, let me match slides. Cool. Um, so generally, wrestling matches were not a matter of life and death, but sometimes things happen. Um, and Will, uh, those of you at CKDF probably know Will, um, he gave me an example of a death in a wrestling match um, from Frasar in 1543. And here's a little quote from it. Um, in, in about it. Uh, Frasart says that at other times they made the wrestlers of the towns and village come uh, where there was a prize for the best and the sport was not ended but that one or another had broken a leg, an arm, uh, a shoulder, or a hip dislocated. Um, so <laughs> he believed that they kept wrestling until somebody got injured, um, which doesn't exactly match uh, the other descriptions we get. Um, but certainly, uh, if he's um, trying to get at the idea that the wrestling would continue and, and somebody would get injured, then that we see that happen nowadays, too. Um, but uh, he continues later on in the paragraph. He says, um, but at last, the big man let himself fall upon the little and in falling, put his elbow upon the pit of his stomach and burst his heart and killed him stark dead. Uh, he later describes that when they opened when the surgeon opened the, the torso of the dead wrestler, uh, it was filled with blood. So clearly ruptured something by driving his elbow into the, the pit of this guy's stomach. Um, uh, but to that, the people watching yelled, this is not in the sport. Uh, and he says that Dativo, the big guy who killed the other guy, um, was known to have done this before and gave this uh, idea that it was shameful to kill or intentionally injure somebody in a wrestling match. Um, and there, there were, as we kind of see there, there are regional expectations for fair play that may differ, um, whether Dativo was just a murderer or if that was accepted in some other area, I, I couldn't say for sure. Um, but we do see 
that idea echoed in uh, like Fabian von Auerswald's manuscript on wrestling, um, who says that some of his techniques are for unfriendly opponents uh, and they are more of the arm wrenching type things that, that you wouldn't do to your friends. Um, but in his opinion, if someone was getting a little rowdy with you, you could bust those out and put them back in, in their place. Um, also lots of regional differences in winning conditions um, for uh, like wrestling tournaments. Monty, I mentioned earlier, uh, gives us some pretty neat descriptions of the different wrestling styles uh, and rules that they used in, in different areas. And I'll go through some of those here. Uh, he's, got, he's got a lot. Um, if you're interested in this stuff, I really recommend looking at Monty. Um, <clears throat> he says that Germany, Hungary, Bohemia, and Poland, in those areas, they wrestle on their feet and hands like quadrupeds. In both Britons, I'm not sure which both Britons are, but in both Britons, uh, it's not a fall unless you fall onto your back. Um, and he says that this isn't right uh, in that in all other activities, um, doesn't matter how you fall to the ground. If you've fallen, you've fallen. And so he believes that wrestling should be the same. Uh, there's no, there shouldn't be any requirement to follow on your, follow on your back. Um, in Portugal, if you fall to your hands and knees intentionally, then it doesn't count as a throw. Um, which <laughs> Monty doesn't like at all. Uh, in Spain, uh, Sicily, and most of Italy, he says that if anything but the feet touch the ground, it's a fall. Uh, and that's what Monty likes to see in wrestling, that the only thing that should touch the ground is your feet. And he, he goes into some detail about why that's the case. Um, his two reasons, uh, I wrote it down. We'll, we'll get to it eventually here. Um, but he also says in some parts of Italy, uh, so in most of Italy, uh, they wrestle how he likes, but in some parts of Italy and in France, they only kind of throw if the opponent lands face up. And he says that this is commonly done in regions where people are both demented and wine soaked. So <laughs> he thinks they're crazy and drunkards uh, for wrestling that way. Um, he says that in Cisalpine Gaul, Cispaduana and Transpaduana, uh, which Milan is the capital of, that they wrestle in a leather baldric um, and that they use only the strength of their knees and hips when wrestling. And uh, Schwingen, one of the traditional styles that we'll look at a little bit later here, um, may be a good depiction of, of what he's describing there. He says that in Greece, they don't grab the legs, but it, uh, so that's a good thing uh, in his opinion. But he says what they get wrong is that they don't count it as a fall unless the opponent is laid out flat. So they've got to be flattened out on the ground. Uh, and then the last one he describes is in England, he says that they wrestle with linen cloths around the neck and they twist it around until they fall down from choking. So we saw that depicted uh, in a manuscript right there, right? This, this idea that they use a scarf and choke each other to throw each other. Uh, and, and I do have a video of that that we'll look at. Um, so that was common enough that it was depicted in manuscripts and a guy from not England, um, from southern parts of Europe, actually was familiar with that wrestling style. <clears throat> um, Monty also gives some advice uh, on how you should wrestle and it can kind of be summed up uh, to this. And he says you should fight this way because you're preparing for a real fight. Um, and uh, contrast that with this idea that, you know, people wrestle for fun and for tournaments and things like that. But he says when you're wrestling for, for a real fight, uh, you should stay even, um, have a balanced stance, uh, even um, like even feet. And you don't have one foot leading uh, in front of the other. They're, they're, like a neutral stance. Um, also, he says that there should be no grips below the crotch. Uh, he says this is because leg grabs are particularly bad in armor. You can get stuck underneath somebody. He says that you should never give your back or shoulders to someone. Uh, and that you should always face the opponent so that your eyes can monitor his weapon hand. I thought that was a neat one. And uh, the last 
thing he adds is um, that you shouldn't fall with your opponent. You should stay standing uh, and away from them when you throw them because once you fall into the ground, they could just as easily pull a weapon on you or somebody else can come along and pull a weapon on you. Um, so a lot of these concepts that we hear talked about in like modern self-defense, Monty was saying this, you know, 500 years ago too. So he does provide an example of the types of rules he believes you should use in preparation for combat. Um, so these are potentially uh, the best rules, at least in Monty's opinion, um, that a HEMA person nowadays might want to use to prepare for their art. Uh, so in his opinion that you should wrestle only to two falls um, and that you shouldn't do less because you could get lucky uh, and beat someone or, or lose. And you shouldn't do more because then you'll be too exhausted to continue. So two falls is a good uh, place to wrestle, amount of throws to wrestle to. He says that you should wear clothes for two reasons, because nudity is both unseemly uh, and because in a real fight you're wearing clothes. Um, and he, he says specifically that you should wear a hose and doublet. They can be loosened, but they should be tied together. Um, so that, that's a neat little insight to what we might want to wear uh, for wrestling in HEMA. Um, he says that touching anything other than the feet to the ground should be a loss, which is you know something we see echoed a lot, um, just like we saw with Thor and Ellie. Uh, and if you both fall, whoever initiated the throw should win unless he touched the ground first. So if you both fall and hit the ground at the exact same time, whoever initiated the throw is the winner. Uh, but if you initiate a throw and happen to throw yourself to the ground first, you've lost. Uh, so an example might be like a sacrifice throw where you fall down backwards and put your foot in someone's belly and kick them over your head. Well, you might get a throw, in Monty's opinion, you've lost because you've thrown yourself first. He also says that uh, if you slip or trip uh, and fall to the ground and it wasn't because of something your opponent did, it happens outside of grips, um, and you maybe stumble on something on the ground, he, he says like if you trip on a rock or slip in the grass or slip on marble, um, that it shouldn't be counted as a throw, it's just bad luck. <clears throat> Um, he also mentions that you, should, uh, you shouldn't use shameful grips like grabbing someone's genitals, mouth, nose, eyes, hair, or throat. Uh, we certainly play by those same rules nowadays. Um, <clears throat> and then also a neat one is he says that your legs should attack your opponent's legs and your arms should attack their upper body. Uh, and he says that you should never use your arms to attack somebody's legs. Um, in a different section, he elaborates on that explaining that this is the case because once you've lowered yourself to grab someone's legs, you've uh, given them the high ground essentially so they can attack your head. Um, again, this idea of training for armed combat, even when you're wrestling. Um, although he does elaborate that, and as I mentioned earlier, he says in Germany, Hungary, Bohemia, and Poland, they do wrestle uh, in a way where they grab legs. And in fact, they crawl on the ground like quadrupeds. Um, so that's what Monty says about wrestling. Um, he's got quite a bit uh, in about techniques as well, um, but I, I thought more interesting were his descriptions of the styles of wrestling uh, in Europe and, and the type of wrestling he recommends for preparation for war. <clears throat> on the slips and trips, that, sorry, uh, on the slips and trips, was there any like clarification on how they would just restart that? Would they just toss it out and <coughs> go again from wherever their starting part was, or are we seeing? like a similar setup to what we've been doing where we meet in the middle and start over. Yeah. He doesn't, he doesn't talk about it at all. He just says that um, it shouldn't count as a throw if somebody falls down. He also mentions to be aware of your surroundings um, and that surfaces like marble are, are particularly slippery or wet grass. It doesn't really talk about what to do if you, if you fall. Uh, it, like that, if you fall outside of someone's grips in a, in a competition or match. Um, so the, the other rule set I wanted to talk about, um, really getting to, to the two big rule sets we have, uh, I can't think off the top of my head of, of any other examples of rules from the time period, um, but these were the rules I mentioned earlier, translated by Matt Gallus. Um, <clears throat> they were from uh, 1638 is the date 
he puts on it. Um, and it's a uh, description of wrestling tournaments, how they do in Rome and uh, within 20 leagues around. Um, I'll just go through a quick summary of it. Uh, so before the, the wrestling tournament, the date and the prize is to be announced to all the surrounding parishes. Um, so it's a big announcement so that everybody can, can come in and participate. Um, and uh, <clears throat> it's this big event that uh, the document says is the purpose is to entertain the people and for the competitors to attract mistresses. Um, so that's interesting uh, insight into why they do it. Um, also, of course, winning a prize is, is just like nowadays, that's a big motivator. Um, but before their match, uh, before the matches, they use kind of a lottery system to determine the order uh, and who your opponents will be. <clears throat> it's the description is, is uh, kind of frustrating to read through. Um, but what, the, what I've worked out is what they do is um, select numbers uh, from a pot uh, and those numbers tell you, you know, what, what order you're going to wrestle in. Um, and the way they do it is, Number one will wrestle number two. Whoever loses is out. Um, the winner sits to the side. Number three will wrestle number four. Loser goes out. Winner faces the winner of the first match. Loser goes out. Winner steps to the side. And then the next two go. Uh, and then the winner faces the winner. Um, and, and so on. And it continues until you've got one person standing at the end. Uh, so no description of weight classes, um, no pairing ahead of time, no brackets, uh, nothing like that. Just this sort of lottery system where uh, you win by continuing to win and being the winner at the very end. Um, <clears throat> the area that they wrestled on, uh, what the document says is if it's a paved area, that they should cover it with sand. So either they're wrestling uh, in a field or somewhere with soft ground to fall on, or if it's a paved area, they, they put sand down. Um, we actually see that, uh, I don't know if anyone's familiar with this, um, historical football or Florentine football that, that happens in Florence every year. It's basically like, uh, like handball kind of, you have to throw a ball into, into the goal, but you can like punch and kick and choke and take people down. Um, but they, they lay down this big playing area. They, um, it's this big like piazza in Florence and they um, put all this sand down that they do it on. So that, that idea, I guess, kind of persists to nowadays where uh, if you want a softer ground and you've got paved area, you just throw down sand. Um, <clears throat> so he says that they should wear, uh, sandals and short shorts. Um, obviously, it doesn't say short shorts, but <laughs> that's my description of it. Um, very short. Uh, I think trousers maybe was the word in it. But but the idea was that they, they were short shorts. It, it's not like a long um, pants or, or like tied up pants or anything like that. Um, and uh, they also tied a cloth around each other uh, for grips as well. Um, and he makes a point of saying that they tie the cloth around the opponent to make sure that there's no cheating and that the opponent doesn't tie their cloth kind of crappy. Um, so uh, if it gets pulled off, then it was your fault for tying it poorly. Um, <clears throat> so on their entry, uh, as they start to wrestle with each other, uh, they enter by kind of mocking each other as they, they approach. And it says that they're punching and kicking in the air and uh, putting in a foot, trying to get the other guy to commit to an attack. Um, but eventually the, the serious wrestling begins and somebody gets a throw. Um, and uh, it doesn't say how many throws in this particular document it is a win. Um, but it does say that uh, at the end, the winner will kiss his opponent to show that there's no ill will between the two competitors. Uh, and also that if somebody happens to be injured or killed during the wrestling matches, uh, that there should be no charges brought against this person. Um, so that's a cool description of like what a wrestling competition was in, again, that's 1638. So that's a little bit later, a hundred years later uh, than the initial time frame I mentioned there. But um, 
that's you know we we take what we can get in regards to these kind of descriptions there are not many of them so they also had a lot of different like wrestling types of games um and uh they were generally generally had um some sort of imbalance to it uh and they tested skills outside of um, just your general wrestling skill, uh, often like balance and agility. Um, and they're usually pretty lighthearted and silly. Uh, uh, Von Auerswald mentions that, you know, they're, they're fun to watch, but, but silly in, in terms of like how we would view them nowadays. Um, and I've got some images here. So in the top left, we see sort of that, uh, what nowadays we might call chicken, where people are wrestling on top of each other's shoulders. Um, in the top right uh, is, they called it the quintain. Um, you like push on each other's feet and you see there's that imbalance again where, where one person's standing, one person's sitting. Um, presumably you're trying to make someone fall down or stand up or something there. Uh, and, and that's pretty commonly depicted in, in medieval manuscripts. Um, bottom left is an image from the Goliath Feck book uh, and not, totally clear but down in the the bottom there the guy on the left has got his foot in a hole um or a little like divot in the ground and the other guy's hopping on one leg uh, they called that ringing him group line it shows up in a couple different hema sources um and in the bottom right is a uh they still do that nowadays in, in like strongman modern strongman competitions um slightly different setup but this idea that you're sitting down and, and you've each grabbed one side of something and your goal is to pull until the other person is forced to stand up. Um, so these kind of funny games that are sort of uh, part of wrestling, you know, there, there's a physical struggle, um, but it's not just outright wrestling. Certainly not something that Monty would say prepares you for war. So I've got a couple of examples um, so that you're not just hearing me talk and, and seeing pictures. I, I wanted to show some video of some uh, traditional styles that are still practiced nowadays uh, and then some uh, modern recreations of some of those weird wrestling styles. Um, they're not long clips. We'll, we'll probably look at like one minute each, um, not the whole video. Uh, so this first one is Goran. It's practiced in Brittany. Um, and it is very similar in appearance to like what we see in Von Auerswald's wrestling. <laughs> Sorry, that was really loud. <laughs> um, something neat about this video, you see they, they've got those kind of cool carved plaques as prizes, um, but it's part of a festival, which is like what we just see described in Gallus's uh, document that he translated there. There's the other sand or sawdust pit They've got these special jackets for gripping. Uh, they have to embrace each other in between each throw. You see they've got this leg hook, which is common in, in some of the wrestling treatises, hema treatises. Um, but it's all upright. You know, you see there, once they throw to the ground, there's no more wrestling that occurs. Um, definitely stopping a lot sooner than like modern hema wrestling tournaments. <clears throat> That's a big throw as you're picking people up and throwing them to the ground. The goal with this rule set too is to put the person on their back, correct, for maximum point score? Uh, yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, so yeah, the you win by putting someone flat on their back. Um, I don't remember if, if they require two points of contact or four points of contact, like Cornish wrestling, or maybe it was three. Um, but I'll, essentially, you want to throw someone onto their back to win. So Monty wouldn't have liked it. Actually, he says he doesn't like it. That's one of the examples he gives. Um, Goren appears to be pretty similar to what's described as practice in that area um, by Monty and, and other sources. Um, so there seems to be at least some sort of uh, – if not lineage or, or direct tradition, some influence from medieval wrestling styles till nowadays. Um, this next one, Schwingen, Schwingen uh, is, um, 
I believe the Swiss, Swiss national sport. Uh, they have huge, you'll see in a second, they have huge competitions. Um, and, and this is um, some guy, Hans Peter, who uh, got his own highlight. He must be really good. Um, we see a lot of the same sorts of things. See, they're filling out stadiums for this one. Um, but we've got the sand or the sawdust on the ground. Um, this style does have some extended groundwork. Um, so we're, we were seeing about, uh, Monty talking about some styles in some areas have, they crawl on the ground like quadrupeds. We see that here. <clears throat> Should start in a second. Um, you can see that they, uh oh, there we go. You can see they have these special like uniforms that they wear, um, these shorts that they can grab. Um, and this is the one I was saying fits a description that, that Monty gave of using their knees and their hips, right? There are lots of lifting motions, they're, they're stuck close to each other having to wear these belts. Can you guys see the screen when, when it goes out like that, or is it going black for you too? I can see it. All right, it's just gotten out of my mind. That's fine. Yeah, it's a little choppy, but we can see it. All right. So that's that for that one. Um, you can see some similarities and some differences from, from the last one. Um, here's an example of like a backhold style of wrestling. Uh, it's hard to find a great video, but but this one was had a neat throw in it, so I included it. Um, it's common in uh, like Celtic styles, um, Scotland, and, and they have like a modern Celtic uh, wrestling federation that does backhold as well as Goren and, and some other styles. You can see they've got their hands locked behind each other's backs, and they they're not allowed to break that grip. This was pretty commonly depicted. even when it becomes inconvenient to keep the grip. A nice throw at the end. The whole time I was like hyped up for a fork and it was even better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess it looked kind of like a, ha like a half hip, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Like he tripped um, and then the trip was a fake out, I guess, and then he went into the half. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, so this is neat. This one, uh, apparently a Lithuanian folk wrestling style. This looks a lot to me like what we see in, in HEMA competitions nowadays for wrestling. Um, you might even watch this and, and mistake it if you didn't see the title of the video. You can see they've got their special clothing on. Um, neat that they use rope for belts in some cases there. <clears throat> so they start from a middle. They don't go from outside of grips. Yeah, 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 yeah. they start close in. There's a lot more ground action too. Like a lot of their throws went to the ground. Yeah. And, and it seemed like they're kind of trying to stay on top um, when they go to the ground. So there, there may be some consideration for reversals and stuff like that in that as well. I, I don't really know too much about it, but I thought it was neat because it, it looked a lot like what happens nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, and, well, I mean, it, it's from nowadays, the video, but you know. Similar they, to the stuff it, we've been doing. Exactly. They, they develop separately and, and looks pretty similar to what we're doing. Um, <clears throat> here's some guys uh, out in France who did uh, some examples of the scarf wrestling that we see. Not choking each other like Monty describes, but kind of doing a cross face with the scarf to make someone turn and fall down. Hey, there's a joke. <laughs> That's interesting. 
Yeah. Are there are there any like no punching like face pushes are okay, but punching's not. Uh, that we found on those. I don't think there are any rules documented anywhere. Uh, it, it's like images and manuscripts and, and descriptions of the fact that people did this. Um, <clears throat> so I, I couldn't tell you. Because <laughs> that initial one looks very much like a punch. Yeah, <laughs> throw a right cross and <laughs> into it. Right? And, uh, <laughs> and then make um, it look like you're pulling him to the ground. Yeah. This next one, it, it's actually a video that we made when I was at VAF, like eight years old. Uh, so you seem young me. Um, but this is ringing in group line, which is that uh, one from the Goliath effect boost that we saw earlier, uh, where you have to keep one foot in a hole and the other foot, the other person has to hop on one foot. But it, it's a lot of fun. It's silly and people laugh and no one ever really gets hurt with this one. I think that's enough. Um, so, funny fact, uh, the, the very first wrestling competition at a long point was this, ringing him group, group line. Um, and we had to create this uh, rule set that could be used in a tournament um, from very little detail about how, <laughs> how you could uh, – rules on, on how this is supposed to go. Um, but this general idea that one person stands with their foot in a circle and the other person has to hop on one foot and um it was fun but we never did it again <laughs> the very first long point uh ringing competition was like that and, and after that we opened it up to a more kind of freestyle version like we see nowadays freestyle in the sense that there are fewer restrictions not like modern freestyle wrestling we did use it as a tiebreaker with um nick and brian this year that's right yeah in, in the uh the local league that we were doing there was uh, a tied match um, for, I think, first and second. And the tiebreaker, we just did this game um, because everyone was so exhausted. We did massive pools for the first one, and it was um, – oh, no, it was um, – yeah, Their matches all went into overtime, so they were wrestling for, like, three minutes yeah, yeah, straight. Yeah. For, it was, like, That's nuts. Right. Yeah, and, and then at the everything else event, we did the huge pool. where they Oh, Nick says it was a three-way with him, Brian, him, and David. All right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's fun. It is a lot of fun. Um, and if you've been training the leg hooks, uh, it's a great way to practice those. Um, this last one, I, I did a little clip from my Instagram a couple years back. Um, geez, 2016. And uh, this is <clears throat> something we see depicted in one of Tallhoffer's manuscripts. Um, he just says uh, Das Französisch Ringen, which is like the French wrestling or the Frankish wrestling. Um, I think I have an image on there. Yeah, we're using one hand, other hand tied behind your back or held behind your back. Here's Hank throwing everybody. Um, Hank dominated in the armored uh, portion of the last long point using his pretty decent grasp of wrestling to beat a lot of people. I kind of want to play this game. I think that's one we haven't done yet. We'll have to do it. If we ever get it back. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so those are just some videos of um, modern uh, recreations of things that we see and also uh, living traditions um, still practiced throughout Europe that can kind of give us an idea of what things might have looked like. 
just some visual examples there. All right. <clears throat> so moving on to our next session. Um, well, actually, I should summarize some stuff here. Um, so uh, this idea of, let me go back, uh, a common wrestler um, with somebody, uh, in my opinion, who might have been able to, you know, walk in and, and compete under any of those rules and, and do somewhat well, kind of understand what's going on, um, wrestle in, in that sort of way, uh, which is, um, depending on which manuscript you're looking at, maybe pretty distinctly different from um, the HEMA wrestling that you may be doing. Um, I mentioned Fabian von Auerswald is really similar to Guren, um, but uh, that style is pretty different from Tallhofer, for example. So um, just things to consider and compare and contrast. But this idea that you know, wrestlers had some sort of wrestling background and, and it may have looked something like the stuff we see there. <clears throat> so, um, wrestling in HEMA, starting in the past, we'll make our way to the present. Um, the masters spoke pretty highly of wrestling. Uh, and I've got kind of three quotes there, but I've got a lot more to say about it. Um, you know, do we want to take a five minute, uh, break here real quick let's do that i'm gonna to run to the yeah. bathroom and, and then we'll finish up um, yeah we can do that yeah i think that might be a good idea cool cool so, so at we'll take five minutes 9 15 9 20 it's like 9 10 uh, now so 9 15 9 15 is good i've got 907 on my clock so just yeah. five minutes five minutes from whatever your clock says right now which is 912, according to Verizon, it will be 912. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See you soon. <laughs> All right, I'm back, but we'll do, we'll give another two minutes, according to my clock, two more minutes. Yeah, you're two minutes early.
telling you, this lecture is making me miss Riggins so much more than I already do. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I've been studying for lots of other stuff. And then having to work on this, I'm like, man, I really want to start wrestling now. <laughs> Are you doing PMP? No, no. Pro Project Plus was enough for me for now. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll get to PMP eventually, but not until I'm closer to looking for a different job. But I'm, I'm good where I'm at for now. All right. It's 9-12, so <clears throat> we'll go ahead and just jump back into it here. So um, the Masters had a lot to say about wrestling. Well, they spoke highly of it. <laughs> they didn't necessarily have a lot to say about it. Um, and uh, what I wanted to do with, with this particular uh, section is um, use their words to describe how important it is uh, and not, um, not put in any of my opinion about why it's so great, um, which we can get into after what they say about it. Um, but we'll start there. So the three quotes I have on, on the slide here um, from uh, 3227A, Derbringer, um, the the anonymous author, um, the commentary on what he describes as Lichtenauer's wrestling, uh, which is um, the only wrestling described as from Lichtenauer as opposed to like Odd or Lignitzer or someone else. Um, we also see from Fiore and again from Monty. So uh, anonymous commentary on Lichtenauer's wrestling. Um, this author says, uh, and know that all grace and skill comes from wrestling and all fencing comes fundamentally from wrestling. Uh, this is very similar to what Duarte said in that very first quote we looked at, one of the first quotes we looked at at the beginning there. Um, <clears throat> so all fencing comes fundamentally from wrestling, uh, which is that common phrase that we hear repeated all throughout HEMA. Um, Although first presented as governing principles of my art of grappling, um, the guards and posts that he describes are actually the foundation of my entire art of armed fighting, whether on foot or horseback, uh, whether in or out of armor. Um, so not explicitly saying wrestling is the foundation there, um, but saying that the, the guards and the actions he shows through wrestling um, are governing principles of his entire art. Um, and he does start it, start his uh, treatise with the wrestling stuff. Um, <clears throat> and then Monty says that no other skill, neither throwing, nor acrobatics, nor play of arms, nor equitation, uh, teaches us to temper and control our bodies like wrestling, and always to know how to respond where necessity arises. Uh, I like that one a lot. Um, not necessarily because it, it compares it to, you know, these, these other things you might do to, to be in shape, um, which is a cool comparison. Um, but because he talks about temper and control, which is in my opinion, I know I wouldn't say much about my own opinion, but adding commentary to that one particular quote, in my opinion is one of the um, real benefits of learning to wrestle is um, learning control, like physical control of, of yourself and another person. Um, as well as uh, like temperamental control, um, when to push, when to retreat, um, when to be more aggressive or, or more, more passive. Um, those things are built really well in, in wrestling uh, where you're physically engaged with somebody. Um, <clears throat> there, there are some other quotes that I wanted to read, just didn't want to, you know, death by PowerPoint and put them all into, on the slide there. Um, so there's a 16th century poetic rendition of Ott's wrestling. Uh, so not written by Ott, but written about his wrestling. Um, and in it, uh, part of it towards the beginning says, um, and then you must, before all else, learn wrestling. When I say to you, honestly, wrestling is indeed a foundation for all nightly activity. Um, so again, learn to wrestle before everything else. Um, in, in this case, he, he means you know, all the weapons that Leishtenauer's Zettel lays out. Um, 
in that wrestling is the foundation for all nightly activity, similar to what we see in uh, 3227A. Um, <clears throat> so I mentioned Duarte, talks about it quite a bit as well. Um, and he provides seven reasons for why wrestling is better than everything else. Again, in his book on horsemanship, he, he saw it fit to add this section. Um, so he says, uh, I'll go through, I'll just read the seven um, rather than reading paragraphs worth of text here. Uh, so the first is that, um, he says, first, great increase in agility which is a great advantage in all works. Second, great improvement of strength in hands, arms, legs, and the rest of the body. Third, fluidity, confidence, and daring to grapple with any man, however mighty he may be. Fourth, great mastery in knowing how to grapple with our hands and defend and sustain according to the nature of the one with whom we come arm to arm. A little weird one. Um, so great mastery and knowing how to grapple with our hands, um, defend and sustain according. Uh, and that's similar to like what Monty says about knowing how to respond when necessity arises. Um, fifth, knowing how to deliver techniques of the feet and body and deflect them, block them, and circumvent them according to each technique. Being instantly ready at the moment of execution for with good knowledge and great practice, the entire body will know what it needs to do in each moment of such need, um, which I found to be true. Uh, and Marlene, you might be able to chime in here with your experience, but with, with enough practice, your body just kind of does the right things at the right time, um, and which becomes more common the more, the more you do it. Uh, would you say you found that to be true, Marlene? Yeah. Um, so, and, and Gamayna Specting guys can attest to this too. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I harp on everyone to try ringing or at least take a few classes so they have the basics down because what it really does is it puts you in tune with your body and it puts you in tune with the other person's body in a way that nothing else really can like maybe ballroom dancing is a good um uh partner maybe to this but that's yeah, more you... cooperative whereas here it's it's it you don't have that cooperative partner so it teaches you how to react and respond in a different way yeah, and, and some of your reactions to um, fooling, if you will, is, is becomes automatic. It, it's not a conscious decision. It's just like, oh, I feel this, and, and this is what I've trained to respond with. Right, and then the really fun thing is when you can feel what they're going to do before they even do it, and you just give yeah. them that look, and they're like, dang it, you knew. Like, and like <laughs> yeah. I know you can attest to this, because that's literally every time you and I wrestle, where you're like, okay, but you're going to do that thing that you always do, and I'm like, yeah, I know, but like, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, all right, so uh, the last two here. Um, so number six, uh, with good knowledge and practice of this art, we lose much of the reluctance and impediment to try and learn many others because it makes the body more adept and others will be less difficult and less dangerous on account of this one. Um, I think that's very true. And seventh, the last one, uh, to be more praised by our lords and friends, more recognized by strangers, and more feared by our opponents, according as each of us naturally possesses uh, the other good dispositions and advantages. So seven is basically uh, people will like you, fear you, and know you better uh, because of the six benefits I mentioned before. Um <clears throat> He goes on to talk a little bit about uh, we build courage and self-confidence when we wrestle, uh, which uh, is also uh, an idea that um, is echoed pretty frequently through uh, like modern folk style wrestling in, in high school and college. Um, courage and confidence and, and uh, motivation, um, all those sort of things that, that you build while wrestling. And uh, he kind of ends this section by saying that, therefore, I advise anyone who is of knightly rank and others to whom it is suitable that they should work to know this art well and to practice it well and according uh, to a way that's suitable for them. Um, so basically, he recommends this to everyone who can do it. Um, and I think that is the most succinct uh, historical description as to why everybody loves wrestling. Um, do you think he's saying, 
Do you think he's saying do it to everyone who can or more do it to the level at which you can? Like everyone should do it to the best of their ability, but nobody has to be that night. Um, I, I think he, he's saying you should practice this uh, to whatever extent you can. Um, so to practice it well according as is suitable for them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, He Basically also says great that, and everybody should totally do it. Yeah, and, and he says if you practice and you get good at it, that it won't fail you and, and the, the skills will never leave you kind of thing. Um, so uh, the, the last one I want to talk about here is, is a quote from Pasha, who's a little bit later, um, 1660s. So in, in that same time period that we see uh, that document about wrestling in Rome. Um, and uh, this is more just to add sort of a capstone to, to the slide here. Um, he says, kind of in reflection, looking back to, to wrestling arts in, in his manuscript, um, that he says, wrestling used to be a useful exercise that our ancestors practiced not only for re recreation, but also in earnest. Um, this is well-known history because it is not only a gift for the whole body, but it allows a weaker man who knows this science and is dedicated to its practice to protect himself from a stronger and even resist him. Um, uh, that last bit is cool about, you know, a weaker man overcoming a stronger man. Um, but more important to me here is, is that he talks about how well known it is that wrestling, um, was practiced, you know, through, throughout those areas and, um, that it was done for both recreation and in earnest. So even about a hundred years after that 1550s kind of date that we put on the end there um he's still talking about how you know back in the old days everyone used to wrestle and they thought it was great um all right so purpose and aesthetic um and, and i use aesthetic here not not in like the physical appearance um but kind of like underlying principles that de define like a system or art um So the first one, uh, Albert Sare, which is Fiore's wrestling, um, he kind of lays it out real clear. Uh, he doesn't mince words about what his wrestling's for. Um, it is a method to defeat that common wrestler that we described earlier. He doesn't use the term common wrestler. I'm putting that in there. Um, using superior locks and holds, etc. cetera. Um, so his uh, wrestling there is all about um, defeating uh, – this uh, this person who's going to be familiar with wrestling and kind of know how to maybe bully you with it, uh, but maybe not know how to kill you with it. Um, and you, you defeat them by uh, escaping their stuff, denying their holds and trashing their joints basically. Um, and uh, he says about grappling um, for grappling, grappling in earnest by which I mean mortal combat uh, where you need to employ all the cunning deceit and viciousness you can muster uh, to be a good grappler you, grappler, you need eight attributes uh, as follows. Number one is strength. Number two is speed. Three, knowledge, um, by which he means knowing superior holds. Four, knowing how to break apart arms and legs. Five, knowing locks. That is how to bind the arms of a man in such a way to render him powerless and defenseless. Um, six, knowing how to strike the most vulnerable points. Uh, seven, knowing how to throw someone to the ground without danger to yourself. Uh, and eight, knowing how to dislocate arms and legs in various ways. Um, so for Fiori's wrestling, we can kind of uh, imagine this guy who anytime someone grabs him, he's just snapping their stuff. <laughs> um, and I kind of, in my mind, I, if you guys are familiar with the art Aikido, um, I imagine Abritsari is like a really mean version of Aikido where <laughs> instead of being like kind of flowy and, and like beautiful and, and kind of natural, he's just snapping people's arms and <laughs> elbows and stuff as they try to attack him, throwing them to the ground and uh, using superior holds. Um, I think it would be a really cool exercise for uh, people who practice Abritsari to watch like modern 
FEMA tournament footage um, and say to themselves, because I think that's a good analogy for like the common wrestler, um, and, and go through and see what what of Fiori's uh, actions that he describes were, would be good to use to defeat the types of stuff that people are doing in tournaments. Um, uh, because Fiori's stuff really isn't suitable to do against your friends. Um, it's pretty mean. Have you talked to Kimmy about that? Because I feel like that'd be something they're up for. Yeah, actually, uh, <laughs> I've got tons of stuff I want to talk to her about. Um, and uh, with all this virus stuff going on, you know, the, the event got canceled, so we didn't get a chance to meet up again. But someday, it'll happen eventually. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so in Ringin, we, we kind of see um, these are my uh, separations of uh, uh, concepts here. Um, they're, they're not as clear cut um, and, and not stated explicitly uh, in the sources um, necessarily, but uh, we, we kind of see like three types of, uh, of wrestling. Um, not three styles, but three types of uh, maybe source on, on wrestling. So the, the first one going to be Ernst, which is like our, our Ernest combat. Um, Giselga, which is like the friendly, um, and then I, I just called it both, where we see like friendly techniques, friendly as in like stuff you can use in, in competition and, and, and for recreation, as well as um, those Ernst techniques, the stuff where you're like doing what Fiori describes. Um, and then some of the source examples we have there um, for the for Ernst, we have. Uh, like ring X, ring X Morge Stossa, geez, that's a mouthful, um, where he's uh, doing like strikes to vulnerable parts of the body. Um, the other wrestling stuff in ring X uh, is very similar um, in, in purpose. You're breaking people's elbows, throwing them to the ground, smashing heads into walls, driving your knees into their groin. Um, so, you know, that, that mesh, meshes well with, like, what Fiori says about striking vulner, vulnerable points, superior holds, throwing people to the ground and keeping yourself safe. Um, Gazelica, which is which is a term um, used in Von Auerswald and other sources, uh, and we'll talk about it in the next slide as well. Um, there seems to be a style that, that uh, is in Von Auerswald and in some others. Um, where they're doing more like competition uh, appropriate type wrestling. Um, and then both uh, a source like Codex Wallerstein where they're doing the joint locks uh, and the strikes, um, but they also have a lot of overlap with Von Auerswald. Um, so purpose and aesthetic, uh, you can take from that what you will, but you know, the Italian stuff is a lot easier to define um, Ringen is sort of, and I use Ringen to describe all the German sources, it's kind of all over the place. Um, it just depends on which source you um, focus your study on. Um, <clears throat> so systems. Um, this, is, this is kind of an interesting one because it, it doesn't mesh up exactly with the longsword stuff. Um, we have standalone things like Fiori, Monty. Um, Tallhofer appears to have uh, a system of wrestling or, or at least um, an idea of wrestling uh, that he builds on and, and develops. You can see across his manuscripts um, as they go on in date, you can see the system kind of come together. Uh, if you look at his wrestling stuff specifically, he reorders and adds things in a way that starts to make a lot of logical sense if, as you look through it. Um, Meyer, of course, is, you know, can be his own standalone source, just sheer <laughs> amount of stuff he has in um, being a little bit later. Uh, and then Lee Schenauer's wrestling uh, that we see in 3227A, um, not necessarily the wrestling that we see paired with his Zettel, which is usually like Ott and Lignitzer, um, but, but that one particular system that he has. So, and, and those are sort of um, standalone. They, they're not 
repeated in other sources necessarily um, and self-contained. They, they have a bunch of solutions for the common problems and, and you could study that alone and be um, proficient in wrestling. Um, and other possible traditions, and by tradition I mean um, it could be that somebody copied a manuscript or it could be that, you know, it's practiced similar techniques in, in a geographical area uh, and it's documented in, in these different manuscripts. We're, we're not really sure. Um, but we see, for example, Ott and Lignitzer, there's a lot of overlap, um, a lot of similarities in um, language as well as technique. Uh, and then we also see in Codex Wallerstein, um, Fabian von Auerswald, Hans Firm, Goliath, um, later Paul Sector Meyer, where uh, there's the exact same techniques that are in the manuscripts. Um, and those are all sort of like the Nuremberg type area. So that, that could have been a system down there, um, a tradition of wrestling, who knows? Or it could have just been people copying manuscripts across, but um, just really the, this particular slide is uh, looking at this idea that Ringin was not necessarily this cohesive thing, that there are all these different sources and all these different styles that we see there. And um, you can kind of, you can dig into all of it um, and you could make a style or, you know, you could look at the individual sources and try to figure out, you know, this is how people who trained under this master or who trained in this area or, you know, part of this, um, the, brother, the Brotherhood of Lichtenauer might have learned to wrestle, you know, the different ways to look at it. Um, you can find almost anything in the sources there. I think that was it. Let me see. Yeah. Um, so now wrestling in the HEMA present. Wrestling in HEMA in the present. Um, <clears throat> so I have on, on this kind of front page for it here uh, a picture of these scales um, for no other reason than uh, the fact that scales in Divaga uh, is a common um, concept and phrase that they use, you know, maintaining balance, either um, your own balance, you know, being balanced within your own footprint, uh, and also finding balance. Um, in the way that you uh, respond to, react to, or, or attack um, your opponent. Balance seems to be a critical aspect of, of how they wrestle. Um, of course, in HEMA, we, we look at triangulation, and, and we'll go through this last part kind of quickly. Um, we're coming to the end um, of research and translation, interpretation and practice, as well as competition and pressure testing. Wrestling is no different than anything else you do in HEMA. Um, we approach it kind of those three different ways. Uh, so competition is funny. I, this is probably the section that people have the strongest opinions about is, is how competition should go. Um, and uh, this is kind of what I believe to be the purpose of comp competition here, um, that it will emulate the medieval sport wrestling styles uh, and is not a simulation of a real fight. Um, so we're not doing the stuff described in Fiore or um, the Morgstasa that's described in Ringek and, and things like that that's gonna hurt your opponent. You're doing the safer things like what we see later on in Fabian von Auerswald, Hans Firm, Goliath, stuff like that. Um, it's a competitive environment to test mastery of the non-debilitating techniques from the medieval sources. Um, so you're uh, able to do those techniques, um, well, you're able to see if you can do those techniques against people uh, who are resisting, um, who are outside of your school, who might not know the same techniques that you're doing. You're, you're able to see how well does the stuff you've been practicing hold up. Um, and, uh, you know, ultimately, if you're able to wrestle in this style, um, and beat people as a wrestler, then beating people when you can use all the all the tricks to break stuff is is a lot easier. Um, if you try to start snapping elbows and you don't know how to wrestle, it's probably not going to go very well. You might get lucky, but maybe not. Um, and again, you know, the the medieval masters expected that there was some underlying uh, knowledge of wrestling 
not just somebody off the street who's never wrestled a day in their life who's now learning to dislocate shoulders and pull shoulders out of their sockets with 82 pounds of force. Um, and our competitions focus on fairness, maximizing mat time for participants, which is different than we saw in <clears throat> historical tournaments where in games where there might be some inherent imbalance in them. Um, you might only get one match and then be out. Uh, but like the historical stuff, there were, you know, we've got regional variations. Um, <clears throat> long point is pretty, like the long point style rule sets uh, is pretty dominant on the East Coast. Um, uh, Surfo down south does a, a variation of it. Um, the medieval, or sorry, the Mid Atlantic League uh, this past year did um, a variation of it. IGX. Uh, has some some of the same sort of spirit as the long point rules, although it more closely follows like what Monty recommended. Um, the other parts of the U.S. are kind of all over the place. <clears throat> I don't know any events rules uh, well enough to to speak specifically as to what it is, but um, kind of some of what we see is uh, they might not require a jacket. They might start from grips. Uh, they might allow more extended groundwork than we do in uh, the East Coast style rules. Um, there's not a lot going on in, in Europe wrestling wise. Uh, there's a group in Canada, uh, not Canada, <laughs> in France that, um, that does a, a style from more like the 1800s, like a Greco-Roman type style. Um, and there's also, um, at Swordfish, uh, it's a lot of overlap with the long point rules. And, and I talked with the organizers over there and, and we share a lot of the same ideas, but a little bit, a little difference in how they play it out. Um, but uh, so lots of variation in, in tournament rule sets and, and how they go. <clears throat> um, and then getting started in ringing. Um, obviously, we want to look at the manuscripts, our source material on Wicked Hour. <clears throat> and uh, contemporary art, another great source to look at. Uh, some of the things we looked at, you know, throughout this presentation. Um, this link here, and, and I can send it to anyone who's interested, was something that I just stumbled upon when I was looking for material for this. Um, and not all of the, the links that he has are, are still active and good, um, but it's just sort of this uh, page with a bunch of hyperlinks to different um, medieval imagery and, and depictions of wrestling and stuff. Um, so it's pretty neat to, to find that. <clears throat> Uh, and of course, the contemporary commentary by like Monty and Dorte and stuff like that, uh, that I reference a lot throughout the slides. Uh, modern sources, of course. Um, I mentioned at the beginning, uh, Medieval Wrestling by Jessica Finley. Um, that is like, well, it's the only book and it is the best book uh, we have on. Um, it's not the best because it's the only book. It, it is actually really good uh, on Medieval Wrestling. Um, she talks about um, wrestling, the context of wrestling historically, the context of wrestling within Lichtenauer's system, and then she has uh, translation interpretation of all of um, Ott's wrestling in there. Uh, the United States Historical Ringing Association, uh, which is a uh, association that um, I created with Jess Finley, David Rao, and Keith Cotter Riley. Um, we've been slacking on uh, <laughs> on things a little bit, um, but uh, it, it's a resource you can go to. We plan to do a lot more with it um, in the future. Right now it's been sort of running behind the scenes and, and kind of sponsoring events and, and people who want to, to wrestle, but we want to be more proactive with it as well. Um, and of course, local instructors. Uh, if you're at CKDF, uh, MKDF, or, or anywhere kind of close in the region, um, I think some FKDF people have come by before. You know, Wednesday nights, 8.30, we, we have class. Everyone's welcome. Um, and uh, the last one, if you don't have access to an instructor, uh, you can look at other arts to build um, some competency in wrestling. And, uh, <clears throat> and um, well, I'll talk, kind of talk about them individually here in a moment. Um, so my recommendation is this order. Um, if you don't have a ringing instructor, it's probably unlikely that you have a traditional style uh, nearby. Um, those are less uh, 
common throughout the world. Um, but if you do, of course, traditional European wrestling styles are, are a great place to start. Um, I have number two as Samba, and actually I'll, I'll skip over. Um, here's pictures of them so you don't have to just hear me talk, you can see them. Um, <clears throat> number two, I put Samba. Samba is not uh, the most common uh, grappling art, but it, it is becoming more common um, to the point where it, you know, relevant to put on the list here. Um, it's, it comes from Russia. Uh, and, and as a an art, it doesn't have a ton in common with what we do, um, but by practicing, you would develop the skills necessary to inter interpret the manuscripts. Um, so it has throws, um, jacketed wrestling, uh, leg grabs, um, and takedowns, sacrifice throws, uh, and they do have submissions in it as well. Um, so you get an idea for how to safely practice some of the joint locks and things like that. Um, Excuse me. Next in line is judo. Um, the reason why I recommend judo is for the same reasons as sambo. Um, the reason why I put judo after sambo is because judo uh, has kind of strict rules on how and where you can grip, um, and also does not allow uh, any touching of the legs. So it, if your hands come in contact with your opponent's legs, they actually have it's pretty severely penalized in competition. Uh, which is not how it always was that that kind of developed over time um, those rules but <clears throat> so it adds uh, um, it detracts from your uh, learning experience in the sense that you won't be learning um, leg grabs like we see in HEMA uh, and you won't be learning to defend them either but you will be learning hip throws trips sweeps um, submissions as well uh, it's worth mentioning that judo is actually probably a lot like how Monty uh, recommended wrestling to go down. Um, not exactly. There's definitely a difference, but um, the idea of feet attacking feet and hands attacking the upper body. <clears throat> so next one there is wrestling. Wrestling technically comes in like three really common flavors, um, folk style, freestyle, and Greco-Roman. I kind of just grouped them together for this. Uh, if you've got wrestling near you, um, it's great. Um, wrestling is actually my background. It, it's what I started with um, before I got into HEMA, and then I did some judo as well. But wrestling focuses on the leg grabs, sprawling, defending your leg grabs. Um, it's a lot closer and lower to the ground than what we see in, in some of those traditional styles and what we see depicted in the manuscripts. Um, <clears throat> and will certainly teach you to be uh, a great wrestler in general um but uh you miss out on things like hip throws um safely doing joint locks um a lot of the uh kind of upper body type stuff um is different because you're so leaned leaned forward and um close to the ground <clears throat> also there's an extended ground game where you try to pin people which kind of ventures outside of uh, what we do and then um, last on the list uh, because it's common um, and it's a great art and you can learn some some grappling fundamentals um, is Brazilian jiu-jitsu it's last because uh, depending on your school um, it, it's it's pretty likely that you'll spend the majority of the time on the ground uh, in positions that are not at all common in the medieval stuff um, <clears throat> but if it's all you've got you know it, it, it it's pretty much everywhere uh, so it may be all that someone has access to. So if you don't have a way to practice with uh, an instructor uh, or anybody nearby who wants to go through manuscripts and stuff, those are your, my recommendations for options. And uh, that kind of rounds out the presentation. Uh, it won't even let me click to the next one because that's the end. So um, that's it. Uh, 9.45. So about an hour and 45 minutes. Um, cool. Well, I, I guess I'll open it for questions uh, if you guys have any. Um, but otherwise, that's the end of what I wanted to to get through there. Is this changing how you're approaching medieval wrestling in a modern context? No, not, not significantly. Um, this is based on a lot of the stuff I've been looking to over the past few years anyway. Um, just kind of summing up my thoughts on them. So I think you're, you're probably familiar with 
the, the things that I would do are already familiar to you anyway. <laughs> We'll go for it. Mm -hmm. Will says he has questions. They want others to go first. Oh, yeah. Will, please ask. And oh, there he is. Will? I'm not sure if you're trying to speak, Will, but uh, if you are, we can't hear you. Uh, well, we can let Will sort it out. Um, um, I've got a question uh, yeah. to stall for time. Uh, so you mentioned Monty has opinions on wrestling and armored wrestling in particular. He's got oh. strong opinions about how the two should be very much, uh, much more closely related. Uh, yeah. Have you come across this kind of generic advice for armored wrestling, uh, you know, through your scanning of sources um, that might be relevant? Or like in it that that has that similar flavor. Um, I don't have any off the top of my head. I don't have any examples of where it's written out in text. Um, but what I can say is the style of wrestling he describes is what I see in the earlier um, medieval German uh, sources. Um, and then we see kind of later on as we get to like. Von Auerswald and stuff. Uh, the stuff he does is not necessarily what you would want to do in armor, by contrast. Right. Huh. <clears throat> Can anybody hear me? Yeah. yeah. Oh, hey. Nice. Okay, cool. Hey, Tim. Um, so, I got. A, I got. I guess I got two questions. Um, the first one, I've... Um, I've, I've, I've heard a lot of people um, ask uh, specifically uh, about striking, like punching and kicking and stuff. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and I never have a good answer. I don't know enough about it. And so I, I, I want to take this opportunity to, like, to get you, the expert on the record, about, about what role, if any, and you know, any examples or, or what's your take on, on, the, on the medieval German approach or, or even the Arborzari approach as well to, to things like, you know, the, what we'd understand is, you know, the, the punching with the fist or, or other sorts of strikes. I know that you mentioned ring X um, stuff, but I think it'd be interesting to extrapolate a little bit about that. Yeah. 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 Um, <clears throat> it is absolutely there. Uh, it just depends on which sources you're looking at. Um, so I mentioned Von Auerswald a lot cause he's what I study the most. Um, he doesn't look at it at all. I mean, in his stuff is, pretty clearly for like recreational type wrestling. Um, but like what we see in ring Ek, um, there are strikes and things that are pretty mean and nasty. Um, there are often things where you're, uh, even in the, what seem a little bit more friendly, like Lignitzer, um, strikes to the throat. Um, Codex Wallerstein has a whole section on, uh, not how to strike, but how to counter strikes. Um, so most of them appear to be depictions of someone like coming at you with a hammer fist or, or like a, a straight kind of hand chop um, in different ways to counter those sorts of things. Um, it's definitely not like boxing. Uh, it, it's more like uh, if I had to draw a comparison, uh, the strikes appear to be more like karate in nature. Um, where, where you're not like in a boxing stance throwing, you know, like a jab and a cross and stuff like that. Is it, is it fair to characterize them as sort of uh, like uh, actions that compel compliance with the, with like the real thing, which is the throw or whatever? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. That was, that was always my kind of my general retort. Awesome. Thanks for, thanks for uh, extrapolating on that. Yep. Um, and, um, and of course, in, in armor, they're going to be a lot less effective. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I, I wonder, it's always, it's always a question back in my mind, mind, what about armor, like for every team of thing that I study? And I don't know, maybe, maybe Ringen has more of that going on, you know, perhaps why there aren't more strikes. Or maybe we're just, we're just have this weird fascination with punching and kicking nowadays. That does, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, maybe we do. 
Because if you watch, you know, like, you know, street fights, a lot of the times, a lot of the punches and kicks aren't very effective. <laughs> and what, what settles things is the actual throw. That's a good point. Like, if you're not trained in, in a striking art that, you know, there's kind of these wild strikes until you get in close enough and someone grabs a guy, picks him up, slams him, he hits his head on the concrete and he's knocked out. <laughs> it was like, oh, <laughs> every time the video ends. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, my second question um, was how, how uh, in this time of quarantine and, and, a, and a lack of training partners, because I've, you, you know, I've tried to get my wife to, to do ringing and anything else. And that's a hard no. Um, and my three year old's just too small. Um, how yeah. are, what are, what are some of, what are some good ways that you recommend training? I, I found a big log that I throw around and it's actually kind of fun, but I don't know how effective it is. Um, <clears throat> so I, I don't know. Do you follow me on like social media stuff, Instagram and things like that? I'll take oh, that. Sorry, what was that? <laughs> Are you following my Instagram account by any chance? Um, uh, I, I'm not on Instagram. I need to, I need to get on there for, for you, basically. I will. <laughs> uh, the reason I ask is I posted a video recently, which was like a, a time lapse of me training in my basement um, that has some ideas in it. Um, but I'll, I'll describe some of them here. Um, so, uh, there's this, uh, thing in judo called uchikamis, um, specifically with bands, um, although there, there are different variations of them, but the banded version, uh, where you wrap like an elastic band or tubing, um, around uh, an anchor and you use that to simulate kind of a person and you're doing these, um, entry repetitions of your throws, uh, pretending like this resistance band is your opponent um they work really well um <clears throat> of course just getting stronger in general will help your wrestling so you can always strength train if you're stuck home, at home alone um using a log could work I, I don't know exactly what you mean by by throwing it around but like i've got a, a wrestling dummy that i throw around um, a log could kind of serve the same purpose yeah, I don't have access to a wrestling dummy. I envy yours so much. So, <laughs> I, yeah. So I found like a, it's a, it's like a dead sapling sort of thing, and yeah. I, I cut it down and saved like a, you know, six foot length of the base to throw uh -huh. around and stuff. I'll, I'll make a video. I'll post it in the group. Yeah. Um, something else I, I recommend is um, reading through the sources and, and seeing if you can do them. Uh, the techniques kind of in the air to an imaginary person, um, which really helps with like visualization and feeling how your own body should move. Um, and then when you get access to a person again, trying to do it and, and see what changes and what kind of modifications you can make. Um, but, you know, any way to just get repetitions in of, of something is, is good. Just like, you know, pre perception or whatever, like body mechanics. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I posted a video yeah. a while back too that had, um, it wasn't a while back. It was like maybe two weeks ago in the ring and group itself that had a, like a compilation of. That's right. Training. Yeah. Check out the ring group. There, there's a post in there. Yeah. Ring groups on Facebook. It's CKDF ring and group. Very descriptive. Yeah. <laughs> I never know how many people know about our groups. no one else has a question i've got another yeah what's up um so you mentioned uh the uh the doublet pointed to the hose uh-huh and uh so i guess it's a two-part question uh, the first one is um how do you think that that would change uh how people wrestle relative to modern uh modern ringing and then the second part is do you have any thoughts on perhaps the construction uh do you think it's just a normal everyday doublet and hose combo or do you think that there's extra reinforcement or something involved um in in what monty describes uh i think it's literally like just the stuff they would normally wear um, mm -hmm. I, I don't think he's describing anything special um <clears throat> but uh as to how it might change um really the big thing that that i see there is because the hose are, are pointed to the doublet, you've got, potentially you've got control over the hips 
um, from the upper body. Mm -hmm. um, so where uh, without something like that, you might be able to move someone's shoulders around and their hips can pre stay pretty stable. Um, but when all of a sudden you can yank on someone's jacket and like their hips are getting moved around a lot more because it's tied to their, to the lower body attire, mm -hmm. um, you have things that might, might happen a little bit differently. Um, we, we started using like belts and competitions like on, in, in our area, um, with that kind of purpose in mind, mm -hmm. um, the belt itself is, is, you know, whatever. Um, but this idea that you've got something to grab onto, to control the hips other than, you know, doing a leg grab or something to, to control the, the lower body. <clears throat> hmm. Have, have people, uh, experimented with this using doublets and hose pointed together? Um, not that I'm aware of, but uh, Jess for a little while was designing um, or, or at least wanted to design something uh, where it was like her wrestling jacket that she created, but, but had that sort of concept built mm. into it where you could have pants that are tied to the, to the jacket. Um, I've talked to people about it. I, I know Spess knows about it, I, or at <laughs> least I believe they know about that, that idea. Um, but it, it, it hasn't gone anywhere that I've seen. Yeah. I think it's a, a harder sell to get people to wear hose. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, but we, it might we, just end up looking like the modern wrestling with a twist, right? The little, the unitards they wear. The singlet, yeah. Yeah, sorry. I didn't know what else to call it. It's a unitard and dancing. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's literally a unitard. Yeah, you're right. <clears throat> Yeah, um, they, we've we've had some ideas about um, like having gi pants where you've got uh, belt loops that mm -hmm. come through holes in the jacket, and you've got a belt that goes around, and that kind of effectively ties them together. Um, but uh, I, I think a belt is close. Um, the problem with a belt is that it can get pulled up your torso, and that defeats the whole purpose. Um, so yeah. it's not exactly there. Yeah, it's almost like the the shorts. Would it? Exactly. The shorts would be a good example or, or like yeah. we, what we saw in um, Schwingen where they had uh, those kind of shorts with the, the sturdy belt yeah. and stuff and like that sort of thing. Mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, because I, I'm actually thinking of making my own hose that's somewhere in my stack of projects and yeah. I would volunteer as tribute if, <laughs> if you need to throw someone <laughs> wearing, you know, properly fitted stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it will likely tear. Yeah. Are you okay with that? <laughs> yeah. I mean, like that's, that's the thing that I'm curious about, which is that if Monty's saying just your normal clothes should go, should work, then like it's going to get trashed. And yeah, if we can definitively know that that's going to happen, that it's going to get trashed. I, I anticipate, I mean, because you know, the hose should, would be wool cut on the bias. There's going to be some stretch and some tear. And so like, the first few throws, you're going to stretch your wool out. Your eyelets are going to get torn. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm okay with that. But then, then that, like, when it happens, that's a result. That's a contribution to our understanding. Yeah. But then it kind of begs the question, like, did this happen every time? <laughs> that's, or is, is there um, something else going on with the construction of hose that we don't know about? He, um, he, he does say to, that you can loosen it. Um, but, but he says to loosen it so that you're not restricted in your own movement. Um, mm. I, I don't know what part that would play in, in protecting the clothing though. So <laughs> I've seen, I've seen some descriptions of um, a linen lining on the inside of hose around kind of the groin. Uh, and I'm wondering if, if I took a set of hose and I kind of built in linen shorts inside, kind of like the Gurren wrestlers, yeah. whether that would improve the performance that you would do a throw and then the stress would be taken on the linen rather than the, the wool. I think Maybe. you've got a project on your hands. Yeah, I know. I, <laughs> I've got too much stuff going on. Uh, but it yeah, sounds like the, one, one way, one the other. Yeah. For science. Yeah. It makes sense though that the linen shorts would act as a reinforcement barrier. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, like when I when I make if I make if I was to make an unreinforced one I would still do it I would still line I think the cod piece but I don't know about the other portions like the brief or boxer mm -hmm. area. 
Ooh, would you have your separate briefs or would you have built in briefs like swim trunks? Uh, I think they would be, they would be attached at the waistband where the eyelets um, go through at the top and then they wouldn't be attached further down. And so, you know, if someone like cranked up on your doublet, you would just get this awful wedgie through the linen. Uh-huh. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is why we haven't gone that route yet. Because every time we think about it, we're like, can you imagine? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I could volunteer. I, I would, I'd be okay with, you know, some, some initial testing on that. Maybe not a ton, uh, but <laughs> Like, you know, and thinking about a different way for, for the force to transfer rather than directly through kind of bias cut wool, because that's just not going to do anything. I mean, or we don't know, actually, but I, I don't, I think it will tear. It'll get trashed. Huh. Steve is asking, did you find any mention of penalties for rule infractions? infractions? Um, <clears throat> the only example that comes to mind is... Um, in that uh, account from Frissard about the the Bretons wrestling, where the the guy killed the other guy, um, and there were there was no penalty, um, but uh, the guy apparently like ran away in hiding, or like left the area never to return. As far as I know, w Will, do you know if there was any anything more to that? Like, did you get charged for anything? No, I don't actually, I don't, that's, it's disappointing for me as well. Yeah. I was, I would think that like, if they knew about this guy killing people, why would they invite him to their tournament? You know? Um, uh, yeah. That's a good point. Cause they mentioned that he was known for having done that before. Yeah. Which it kind of gives me the, um, the idea that, that like a lot of this, um, a lot of these, uh, tournaments were, um, kind of like open sort of, yeah. you know, like you know, people show up and there's no real, control over uh over who's who's actually you know coming but um there's no rest in terms of federation. rules i didn't people <laughs> yeah, it sounds like what you're saying is what happens in the ring stays in the ring yeah and, and actually um that document uh about the the wrestling tournaments in rome um, does mention that if somebody is injured or dies no charges will be pressed um, so there is that at least, but, um, I, I don't know anything about people, uh, being penalized for rule infractions, you know, because someone, someone could conceivably be injured or killed within the rules. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know about, um, people breaking the rules. It might go back to part of what Adam Franti was talking about with his lecture. Like we're not we're not thinking of it the right way. It was you know the risk of death was something that made it worthwhile in a way. Um, that you know that obviously in our context, if you if you killed somebody, that'd be a big big deal, and you know maybe even criminal penalties and things. But back then, it may have been just a different I don't know expectation or you know um, you know or standard for how for how participants uh, engage in the in the activity you know. Yeah, something kind of comes to mind here. I mentioned that um, the Florentine football uh, earlier on. I, I don't know if you guys know what I'm talking about, um, but uh, it, it's pretty brutal. And, and it's been a, a practice that uh, has been going on in Florence since the Middle Ages, as far as I understand. Um, but they they get seriously injured, uh, and, and it's just part of the game. Um, let's see if I can find a video real quick. Here we go. Here's what's coming up on 60 Minute Sports. Oh, great. Can you guys see that? The wonderful thing about this war is that nobody's heard about it unless you happen to live in Florence. They've kept it almost a secret uh, for centuries. They do not promote this Florentine costume football that they play. <laughs> The first challenge you have as a spectator is where to look because there's so many things going on at the same time. The action can switch uh, in an instant from some brawl in one corner of the square to uh, open field runner trying to zigzag to get to where he can score. The guy with a bandage on his head in that last one. Scoring literally just sliding into the goal head first. You throw a ball into a goal. Okay. But there's a wall. Yeah. 
interneighborhood warfare by another name? Or is this the Crips of the Bloods in funny clothes? Yeah, I, I think it's... Yeah, so um, at least in, in that stuff, my understanding is nowadays that like people get like hospitalized and it, that's just part of the game. I was like one week, I missed it by one week when I was in Florence. They were like packing everything up when I was in there. I was so disappointed. That's a <laughs> I could have seen it. As I think about it though, even in sports like baseball and football, people get away with things that are penalties that would be a crime if it happened outside the sport, like throwing a baseball at someone's head or deliberately injuring another player. It's a good point. Yeah. It's it's I guess it's not really something that I'm surprised by when I think about that in context. And thinking back to the um to the what is it, his name Dativo or Davito? The guy that did the people's elbow to kill the, the <laughs> yeah, yeah Dativo yeah Dativo yeah Dativo yeah killed the what it was called he was called like the uh, the little um, Breton I think yeah the, the but, little guy yeah, yeah <laughs> that um you know that that the that the author uh, uh, Frossart goes out of his way to say and you know and he was you know he he and he like had to leave and he you know he was gone he was out of there. And, you know, because he, because I assume that if he stayed around, he would have, you know, had, you know, bad, <laughs> bad, he lost his honor, you know, bad things would have happened. It's a man without, that has proven himself publicly to be without honor, I guess. So I think, I think there's your, yeah. there's your penalty, right? Yeah, yeah, I think, I think we are possibly missing the whole, that concept of honor. I um, mean, in expanding on that just a little bit, but slightly differently, it, it's, um Monty talks about like you need to be honorable and and how you present yourself like, like when he talks about the Germans and in, in Polish and, and whatever crawling on the ground while they're wrestling he said no stand on your feet like you know be a man not an animal um like have dignity in how you wrestle somebody and what do you what do you think if um if anything Tim what what implications might that have on our modern hema you know take on on historical wrestling like the the idea of um, like how, would our modern sport ideas be you know i guess uh welcome in that in that endeavor for you because you're someone who who i think is you know very influential in how hema practices medieval wrestling today yeah i, I think <clears throat> sorry i think the big difference in our mentality here um is in freestyle, uh, in, in folk style wrestling, there's this extended groundwork with pinning. Um, in BJJ, which is very common, um, particularly because UFC really put it out there, um, it's like all groundwork, uh, all submissions on the ground. We're like really, uh, we go to the ground willingly. Um, in, like in BJJ, for example, like they might literally just sit down and, and what they call pull guard on someone, sit down and kind of pull them on top of you um, so that you're on the bottom. Uh, that appears to be very, uh, very much the opposite of what uh, we saw um, with the medieval wrestling, at least with like what Monty describes and what we see in the German sources. Um, there are some techniques for groundwork, um, but generally, like, you're on top and you're killing the dude. Um, so, th so not much for um, – th there are some. Like, there's always exceptions, but, th you know, there are some things. But uh, we are very willing to, to intentionally down ourselves in order to get a throw, which is something that Monty specifically says you should not do. So definitely no ground games in the future for, for medieval, for Hema ringing. <laughs> um, yeah, like my approach to it with like the long point rules and, and how I usually do tournaments was um, the requirement for ground work is that you do a throw and you have to stay on top. If you get rolled over underneath, uh, we, we see that the bottom was generally their bad position in the ground stuff that we do see. Um, so my modern solution was if you if you do go to the ground you stay on top 
Um, and in addition to that, the rules more recently have been moving towards you get more points if you stay standing rather than going to the ground with somebody. Cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Well, I guess uh, there are no other questions. Cool. Yeah. yeah. I'll let I'll let you all go. Thank you, Tim, for your time and your expertise. Yeah. Thank you for setting this up. This is, it, it it forced me to finally sit down and finish it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and you know I'm I'm trying to get other people within the club and you know friends of the club to think about presentations that they might want to do. Maybe they've already been doing a lot of research like having a presentation do kind of crystallizes a lot of that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, actually uh, next week we're going to be uh, listening to Ken Johansson uh, on the history of the, uh, or the evolution of the medieval sword. And uh, yeah, after that, I think we might take a break of a week or two and then we'll have a whole new set of speakers. We'll put out a call and I encourage you all if you're in the club to start thinking about something you'd be willing to, you know, do a presentation on. Maybe it doesn't have to be an hour and a half if you want something a little bit more casual, something a bit shorter, um, you know, uh, think about it, you know, talk to either me or, or Marlene, we can uh, help get you set up. And that's it. All right. Thank you very much. I'll see you all next week. Or we can hang around and have an after party. Yeah. Thanks thank for you. doing this, Tim. Thank you all. Yeah, and, and thank you all for listening. This is good. And also, I really like the presentation. I think the way you have it set up is good for awesome. future. Thank yeah. You. Hey, I, I'm going to run to the bathroom real quick. I'll be right back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been drinking a lot of water. <laughs>